Well, folks, Hollywood is broken. Hooray! <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Bill Little here with Steve Green and Scott Ott, and this is your right angle on a, a, a well, it's a much bigger phenomenon, but there's a, uh, a a video that's been going around on X where a bunch of Hollywood uh, executives and editors and so on are talking about how there's no work anymore, and they're in deep trouble, and, and they don't know what to do, and it sounds like it's a giant appeal for help, to which I say, ha, 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 ha. For two reasons, not because, not not just because I'm mean spirited, but because, well, first of all, I literally turned my back on Hollywood. I literally did. Hollywood's back behind that wall back there. <laughs> I, I I left it in uh, 2008 or nine when we started at PJTV, the three of us. And prior to that, I'd worked as a Hollywood editor for oh, gosh, I don't know, 15 years, something like that. So I'm 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 a little short on sympathy for uh, for this uh, Steve and Scott. For two reasons, because uh, a lot of these people may not even realize it, but on an awful lot of these people in Hollywood who are out of work now are either incredibly banal or incredibly evil. And so let's uh, pick one and, and start with that. Uh, <clears throat> Steve, the, uh, it's been long enough now so we can probably talk about these ancient Cold War secrets. Uh, there was a group in Hollywood called uh, Friends of Abe that was a, a consisted of conservatives in, in, in show business. That was your sole requirement. You had to love America, and you had to be in show business. That was it. That was that's what you needed to get in, and it grew to quite a quite a decent size. There were sixteen hundred of us at one point. And I ran most of those new member meetings, and the number of times that we would hear people say, producers would come on the set and say, "I want to fire a Republican today," or "Are there any conservatives here? Because if there are, you're never going to work in this town again." And hmm. this this active, open assumption that you were a that you were a far left progressive. The conversations in makeup uh, chairs about how awful George Bush was or how awful Donald Trump was or all of it, this, this, this complete dis disregard, disdain, and disgust for half of the country has cut your audience in half. And if it's cut your audience in half, then it's cut your income in half. And you're responsible for that. So I'm not particularly inclined to want to feel terribly sorry for you about it. Am I being mean or am I being mean and right? Well, uh, <laughs> there are two elements here. The uh, the progressive, the, the left-wingers who run Hollywood, uh, actors, producers, if, if they're losing work. <laughs> okay, world's tiniest violin playing for you, playing for you right here. Um, but the, uh, the, the crews uh, who tend to cover a you know, much broader spectrum. Uh, if they're losing and work, much yeah, more conservative. I feel for those. The, the lower guys. you go down on the on the on the pay scale, the more conservative you are. In all, yeah, of yeah, exactly. Um, and those guys are losing work too. And my heart goes out to them. And you know, the irony here is that the uh, the the human appetite for entertainment is essentially unlimited. And here is an entire city basically devoted to producing entertainment uh, the film tv music whatever it is los angeles makes all of it well now they outsource it to places like uh, like georgia and british columbia and toronto but that's still the they don't make movies in hollywood yeah that's still the city's focus is is making things that people want to pay money to to look at or listen to and the fact that they've just screwed it up over the last 20 years proves a couple of things and actually my real gripe today is uh, actually with the writers. And I I am one, okay? This is how I made my living for, for years and years now. But the Hollywood writers have been pricing themselves out of work uh, going back to the uh, the last big writer strike, which I want to say was back in 99 or 2000. It's It's been a while now. Um, they, they won their strike. They, they got a lot of what they wanted. Uh, but what Hollywood decided is they needed a lot fewer writers. That's when reality TV became so big because reality TV... Exactly, because it's a cheap way to fill an hour. Exactly. Don't need a writer. And this goes back to a sort of a inside Hollywood joke of one of my favorite little movies. Uh, it's a horror comedy called, uh, oh shoot, something Sh Shadow of the Vampire, I think. And the movie is set during the uh, production in 1920 or 21, whatever it was, of Nosferatu, the, the silent German vampire movie. Classic. And the the idea of the movie is Willem Dafoe plays Nosferatu, the vampire. He's not playing the actor playing the vampire because uh, uh, Murnau, I think, was a director, has hired an That's actual right. vampire to play Nosferatu. And his big payday at the end of the movie is going to be he gets to eat the leading lady, right? Gets to sucker blood. And he's just... 
and Willem Dafoe is just hysterical in this role because yeah, he's, tremendous. he's a joke on greedy actors who are always demanding more and more as, as, as the production gets bigger and bigger. And at one point, he's really getting impatient. He, want, he, wants, to, he wants to drink the, the leading lady like right now. And the director's told him, no, you can't have it. You can't have her. And he finally says, then let me have the writer. You're done with him. And I just, I love that joke. That is such an inside Hollywood joke. It's just brilliant. But yeah, the writers have been pricing themselves out for, for 20, 25 years now. And it's, it's sad to see. As again, I'm, I'm a writer. I want to see more writers writing more great stuff that I can read or watch. Um, but the danger of any strike is uh, if you go away, maybe they will find they don't need you anymore. And that's what's happened to the writers. And unfortunately, uh, thanks to their strike and thanks to the crap, woke, uninteresting, unentertaining entertainment they've been putting out, they've taken an awful lot of conservatives and independents, uh, you know, guys further down the, the food chain down with them. And that, that part, Bill, I am very sad, sad to see. So, Scott, um, I said you can divide uh, most of these Hollywood people up into one or one or two categories. You can be both, uh, either evil or banal. Uh, the evil ones are the ones that inject their politics into things like Star Wars and Star Trek and ruin these franchises. Not only not only not provide anything interesting for half of the country, but actively despise them and, and make it very very clear that they do so. So it's a little tough to feel sorry for them. Let's go to the banal side. Um, a lot of these people are out of work because they don't really do anything. Uh, I had a chance to tell the story on the on the micro podcast, which is a true story. Uh, I was an editor in Hollywood for 15 years uh, and uh, had nothing to do with politics at all. And I had a number of occasions to interact with these network executives, these mid-level network executives, generally making around $200,000 a year. I saw a bunch of them on this video. I know these people. I can, I can sense them. I can smell them in the dark. Uh, but here's the thing about these people. They get paid by the studios two, three hundred thousand dollars to go in and give notes on um, on TV shows. And as the editor, I'm the guy who basically does the assembly of the TV show. And I cannot recall a single network executive giving me a note that made the show better. But I can think of hundreds wow. of cases where they made it worse. How much worse? Well, here's the closest I, I can explain it. A session with these network executives could go something like this. They're sitting there and they're watching Steven Spielberg's final cut of um, of Schindler's List. And one of them speaks up and says, uh, Steve, love it. I mean, it's just powerful. It's overwhelming stuff. I mean, it's, just, it's fantastic. Now, look, I'm just spitballing here. I'm just I'm just throwing spaghetti on, against the wall to see what sticks. But I'm, I'm just kind of wondering, you know, it, it, it's a bit dark. And so just not this, but something like this. What if Schindler were to have like a talking dog and, 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 and he was the only person who could hear the talking dog. And then the, 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 the talking dog would be able to like talk to Schindler and he could make jokes and stuff, you know, and you wouldn't have to give up the whole movie thing because nobody else could hear him. That's the kind of intellect, that's the kind of mind that comes into editing bays. And, yeah. and, and I, I see that, that vacant look in the eyes of a lot of these people who are saying, we're completely unsure of what we're going to do. We're just no more work anymore. Somebody please help us. Well, you know, every every industry changes. I can remember being at the, a local newspaper and they had a meeting and they were talking about how we were going uh, to pagination, which is computer layout of the pages of the newspaper, uh, away from the old fashioned system, which involved cutting up strips of paper and paste and put, covering them with wax and sticking them on a board and then taking a picture of that. And that I remember thinking at the time, wow, what happens to all these wax guys? like the people who now do the wax work uh, and the trimming and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and it happens to every, every industry. The thing about Hollywood that's interesting is Hollywood really isn't the entertainment capital of the world, and it never was. What Hollywood was or is – is the is the entertainment finance capital of the world? Oh, that's yeah. correct. It is. It is a financial it's where the deals are made. system. Yes, and so the reason why actors and directors and writers and and best boys and key grips show up in Hollywood is because it's the same reason why you know the mobster robs the bank, because that's where the money is, mm -hmm. and so you go there. 
Well, things have changed over time, and it no longer, the kind of entertainment that people seek now isn't as long form. It's much more short form. It isn't as group oriented where you gather together and watch it. Um, it is personal. It is in your pocket, in your hand. And uh, in, in very crude terms, the cost of a laugh and the cost of a tear has plummeted. And the, what it takes to generate a laugh or what it takes to generate a moist eye has gone down so far that it's within the reach of everybody. So the people who are losing work in Hollywood shouldn't be bemoaning their plight. They should be realizing that it's the same thing that would happen if they had had jobs picking corn. And if the farmer yeah. said, look, we're not going to, we don't need you anymore to pick the corn. We have a machine to do that. Instead of sitting around going, well, I don't know what I'm going to do because I can't pick corn anymore. They should go out and plant Learn their, to code. plant their own farm or write the code to, you know, to control the tractor that harvests the corn or whatever. So anyway, the truth of the matter is today, anyone with a modicum of talent and some without talent can become a producer, can create a project, can pull together a team from around the world of people you don't even know, can generate the funding, and can put together a little project that can get millions upon millions of people to see it. And so because of that, we no longer need to go hat in hand in Hollywood and say, oh, Mr. Studio Owner, um, I would really love to work for you. Is there anybody uh, who needs sexual satisfaction in order to get me a job? <laughs> um, so, you know, this is the best thing that's ever happened to entertainment. Um, so I'm actually very excited about this. I don't wish ill on anybody, even the banal and evil uh, I, I agree. Hollywood people. people. Hurting that. I agree. Yeah, and it's, I feel sorry for them. But the, the truth of the matter is things are constantly changing, changing all the time. And your job in life is not to be standing there going, gee, I, I wonder what's going to happen when that wave gets to me. Your job is to, to lay down and start paddling and see if you can get up on top of it and have a good time while it lasts and then wait for the next one. Well, I got a few things to say about this because I, as I said, this was a big part of my life. And in fact, Making movies is something I thought I was going to be doing from the age of 16. Uh, the first thing I'd have to say to these people is, uh, if you you know, a job in show business is not a real job. We all know it. That's why we like being in show business, uh, Cupcake. And if you're, going to, if you're looking for a lifetime in show business, you have to have nerves of steel. Nerves of steel. I was able to get a job as, as an editor on a show called Sunday Morning Shootout. And I was an editor on that show for five years. You would think now in show business, a five-year gig is is the yeah. it's the it's the second coming. It's manna from heaven. Problem is, is that nobody ever said you're going to be working for five years. Yeah. People said you're going to be working for the next four months, and then we'll look at the ratings. So we never ever knew. Of course, you don't know where your next mortgage payment is coming from. It is not a fun, happy, stress-free way to live. You get to play for a living, and they pay you to play, and you take the consequences. You never know where your next job is coming from. If you've got a job that lasts eight months, you are over the moon. So there's there's that. There's there's as Steve said, the danger of going on strike is you may find that maybe people don't need you <laughs> that maybe they thought that they did. So you kind of brought that one on yourself because Hollywood now is 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 like is like double fossilized. It's making high budget, extremely expensive, awful movies that nobody wants to see. And it's also highly unionized, which means you have all of those inefficiencies. When I was working as an editor in, in, uh, in a studio in Hollywood, I was actually moving a chair from one side of the room to the other because we had to bring enough people in there to watch this particular cut. And uh, one of the producers came in and said, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean what I'm doing? Just moving the chair. He said, you can't do that, man. You can't do that. This is a, this is, we are on a union studio. Yeah. You, you, you get caught doing that. We're really in trouble. What do you, what do you mean? You want, you want the chair moved? No problem. We'll make a call. And they will send a teamster over. They'll bring a union guy over to move the chair from one end of the room to the other. And they were serious. They weren't kidding around. And it got to the point where we would, we would make jokes about teamsters because, because this is ridiculous. You know, how, how tall is the average teamster, Scott? No idea. No one knows. No one's ever seen one standing up before. Um, <laughs> how can you tell when a teamster dies, Steve? Well, he, he drops his donut. So you get the idea, right? I mean... It's got all of this stuff is built into the system that is failing and and 
these guys don't know it, but what they're really saying is we're in the whalebone corset business yeah. and we want to know where the whalebone corsets, corsets are coming back. And the answer is they're not because because of the internet, we can have three absolutely talentless people sit here and do the same job for 15 years <laughs> and just barely scrape by enough money to make a living doing it. That's, that's how low the bar is now. Uh, and I don't ever watch anything that's produced anymore. The thing about, about user-generated content is you don't get to be powerful and famous based on whose butt you kiss most effectively. You genuinely have to deliver the goods. And when I think about the people that I do spend time watching, every single one of them are YouTube channels that are successful because of the sheer talent of the people that produce that content. They're very good at what they do, and that's why I watch them. Now, we're an exception to that rule, but I'm happy to live in that corner. For Steve Green and Scott Ott, I'm Bill Whittle. We'll see you next time right here on your own internet-produced, absolutely independently financed, BillWhittle.com, right angle.